Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our programming today is sponsored by Awake Us Now. We are a ministry with a heart to see awakening and revival in America. Thank you for joining us on our two-year study of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is an exciting series that will truly help open our hearts to Jesus, our Messiah. And now, here's Pastor Dodge with today's message. Good morning. God's blessings to you today. Welcome to Awake Us Now as we continue our study of God's Word. You know, we've been taking a look at the the account of Luke, the evangelist, a medical doctor who was a missionary uh, and a companion of the Apostle Paul. Luke gives us some amazing material in his Gospel. And, And what we've been doing over these past weeks is we've been taking a look at material that is found only in the Gospel of Luke. Today we take a look at another such example. It is a visit Jesus made to his hometown. Although Matthew and Mark also share information about a visit to Nazareth, it appears, and and I want to stress that, there are many, many scholars who would differ on this and many Bible students who say they speak of one and the same visit, but I believe that a careful examination of the evidence would indicate that Luke records a different visit than do Matthew and Mark, and it occurs very early in Jesus' ministry. So we're going to be looking at that this morning, but I think it's very important that we approach this very powerful and uh, thought-provoking section of God's Word with a, a reverent spirit. And so I'd like to share with you words from God himself. This is from Isaiah chapter 66. This is what the Lord says. These are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Aren't those powerful words from God? These are the ones he looks on with favor, not those who are proud and arrogant. In fact, in the book of Proverbs, we read, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are abomination to him. And first and foremost at the top of the list, haughty eyes, a proud spirit. God desires us to be humble in his presence. Our God is humble. And he calls his children to receive everything that he has to offer with thanksgiving and with joy, not boasting in our accomplishments, but rather in awe of his mercy, his love, his grace, not looking at others and saying, look how much better I am than they are, but rather simply saying, there but for the grace of God go I. It's all about his mercy. It's all about his love. And that is something that is going to show up in bold relief as we take a look at these words from Luke chapter 4, the story of Jesus' hometown visit. Would you join me in prayer, please? Lord our God, we we come before you desiring to truly have a, a humble spirit. We want to be those whom you look on with favor. We desire to be contrite in our hearts, repentant before you, humble, recognizing that every good gift comes from above. Lord, may we also tremble at your word. May your word of truth speak so powerfully into our hearts today that we will be forever changed. Lord, may we not take anything for granted. May we instead Approach your word with a spirit of humility that leads us into an ever deeper relationship with you. We pray this in the strong name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is risen from the grave, who is triumphant over death and the devil, who casts out demons, who restores the brokenhearted, who binds up those who are wounded and battered, who gives life to the dead and who is returning soon. To you be glory, Lord, today and always. Amen. Amen. Well, let's get started, shall we? If you would take out your Bibles this morning and open them to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. I'd like to begin this morning at uh, verse 14, as Luke talks about what took place after Jesus' baptism and, and his temptation in the wilderness. Luke, like the other gospel writers, tell us about Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. He gives us information about how Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. And now he picks up the narrative. And that's where we start in verse 14 of Luke chapter 4. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. 
Now, Luke starts out with that very positive and optimistic description, but that's not where he stops. And instead, Luke gives us the rest of the story. Many people have referred to the earlier parts of Jesus' ministry in Galilee as the, uh, as the great Galilean summer, a time when our Lord was doing astonishing things and huge crowds were coming to him. But just as in the Midwest, you go from summer to winter, so also in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, you go from Galilean summer to Nazareth winter. And that's where we're going to focus our attention this morning, where Luke focuses his, not simply on those who willingly receive what Jesus has to offer, but on those who are skeptical, those who are hardened, and those who, quite frankly, are proud and arrogant and boastful and who do not get to experience what Jesus has to offer. This is the way Luke describes what happened next. Verse 16, Luke chapter 4. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. You know, if you go to Nazareth today, it's a fairly large town. But what remains from Jesus' day is very, very limited. However, there is a spot in Nazareth where you can get a glimpse of what it may have looked like in Jesus' day. It's called Nazareth Village. It is a a, a spot intended for tourists and, and visitors to recapture what Israel of the first century may well have looked like. Years ago, with some friends, Jan and I went to Nazareth Village. We had a wonderful time. We had uh, had lunch, a, uh, a dinner, first century Jewish dinner, and uh, also got to explore this attempt to recreate Nazareth of Jesus' day. Here are some close-up photos of a synagogue that is based on uh, archaeological discoveries of synagogues from the time of Jesus. It gives us a a glimpse, perhaps, uh, of what it may have looked like in Jesus' day. This is not the real synagogue that Jesus went to, but it may well capture what his synagogue looked like. A small town, a small area where people gathered together to worship and praise God, set up in a way that was very common among the Jewish people of the first century. Benches along the walls as uh, individuals would sit and hear the word of God and give worship and praise to God. Jesus, as was his custom, went to the synagogue when he came back to his hometown of Nazareth. We also know from what the rabbis tell us what the service may have looked like. In fact, what the rabbis tell us and what Luke tells us really do work quite well together. This is what we, we know from Jewish writings of the period. Normally, when people gathered together in the synagogue, the rabbis tell us, they began with singing, and they sang songs of praise to God, especially Psalms 145 to 150. If you take a look at those psalms in your Bible, you will notice that uh, Psalms 146, 147, 148, 149, and 150 all begin with the words, praise the Lord, or in Hebrew, hallelujah. Uh, These are songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. And and from what we know from first century sources, this is the way worship began in the synagogue on the Sabbath. It was then followed by a recitation of what's called the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. In Hebrew, it sounds like this. Now, admittedly, this is with a little bit of a Minnesota accent, but it goes like this. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. As devout people gathered together in worship of God at the synagogue, they would announce what Moses had proclaimed and what the Lord had spoken as it's recorded in the Torah. God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then they would have recited, according to the rabbis, what's known as the Tefillah, the 18 benedictions. They would bless and praise. This was a time of prayer and a time of thanks to God. Uh, Often these were words spoken by rote, but sometimes they also included heartfelt prayers as well. That was followed by a reading of the scriptures. First from the Torah. 
from the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and then a reading from the prophets and, and sometimes from the writings. After that, an individual would sit down and give an interpretation, explain what the scripture spoke of. And then at the end of the service, they concluded with what is known as the Aaronic benediction. It comes from the book of Numbers. It's what God told Aaron he was to speak over the children of Israel. And in the synagogues, they would speak those words. One person would speak the words of God in that benediction, and the rest of the group would respond with the word, Amen. And they would break it up like this. The Lord bless you and keep you. And the gathered worshipers would say, Amen. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. And they would say, Amen. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Shalom. And the crowd would say, Amen. And that, as best we can tell from the evidence that survives, is what took place in the synagogues. And what Luke tells us here in Luke chapter 4 fits well into that. Jesus goes back to his hometown synagogue. He goes to the place where people had known him since he was a boy. Although he was born in Bethlehem, even as the prophets predicted, he grew up in Nazareth, up in Galilee, in a small town that is not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. Nowhere in the Hebrew Scriptures is Nazareth mentioned. In fact, when one of Jesus' soon-to-be disciples heard that he was from Nazareth, he responded, can anything good come out of Nazareth? This was not what you call the, the city where movers and shakers came from. But some of the latest evidence indicates that it was a very devout area. In fact, from what we know from the writings that have survived and the evidence that has been unearthed, this area of Galilee was the equivalent of the Bible Belt in ancient Israel. And it's there that Jesus returns home to people who had seen him grow up. People who would have known this is one good kid. After all, the Bible tells us he was like us in every way, except without sin. Jesus would say later on in his ministry, can any of you accuse me of sin? Because he was sinless. It's what the Bible tells us. It is what the evidence indicates. It is what the hometown crowd knew. And so Jesus comes back home. And he comes back home to an audience that has heard all of the stories of what has been going on in the rest of Galilee. Stories of miracles, stories of remarkable teaching, stories of Jesus doing incredible things. And now he comes home. And on the Sabbath, they all gather together in the synagogue. They worship the way they've always worshipped before. But suddenly, Jesus does the teaching. And that's where Luke continues this account. We read, end of verse 16. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then, Luke tells us, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Do you realize what Jesus is saying? He has just read from some of the latter chapters of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 58, verse 6, and Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. He is announcing that he is the one that Isaiah and the other prophets had predicted would come. The one who would be the Messiah, the Savior, the hope of the nations, the Messiah of Israel the one who would restore all things. Jesus is making a remarkable claim in his hometown. And the hometown crowd who grew up with him, 
They've heard the stories of what he has been doing. And now Jesus says, after reading these words from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, by the way, don't you wonder, was that the appointed reading for the day, or did Jesus just turn through the scroll and choose it himself? We don't know for sure. One thing we do know, he is making a remarkable declaration. He is saying, I am he. Today, these words are fulfilled in your hearing. Today, these words have come true. Here's what Luke tells us. He says, All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips because Jesus did give them, truly, words of grace. He said, and again I quote, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Good news, that's gospel. Good news to those who are poor, not just to those who are economically going through difficult times, but to those who are poor in spirit as well. You know, we live in a culture that admires the rich. Take a look, for instance, at all the news reporting. What you see on television, what you read on the web, if you still read the newspaper, what you see there, you will see that so much of the news coverage is based on the lifestyles of the rich and famous. But God treasures those who are poor, and those who are poor in spirit, those who don't have it made. And what's interesting, you look at the lives of the rich and famous, and they are also often very poor in spirit as well. The old line that money can't buy happiness is incredibly true. Just take a look at the latest news. But Jesus proclaims good news to the poor, to those who are desperate, to those who don't have everything, to those who realize without God's intervention, I am in horrible shape. And Jesus speaks words of grace, good news to the poor. Today, if your spirit is down, if your attitude is depressed and discouraged, you need to hear from Jesus words of grace, good news, gospel, hope to the poor in spirit. But that's not where he stopped. He said, He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Freedom for the prisoners. Freedom for those who are in bondage. Now, that speaks obviously about prisoners of war and people who are in jail, but it also speaks of those who are imprisoned and in bondage to sin, to sex, to depression, to discouragement, to anger to bitterness. Jesus brings words of freedom. He brings a word of hope to those who right now feel that they are imprisoned and in chains because he breaks those chains and he does it through his life of perfect obedience, through his sacrifice on the cross, through his mercy to those who are poor in spirit and to those who are in bondage because of their sin. He offers words of grace. And he says the very thing the prophet Isaiah had predicted is found true and fulfilled in him. Freedom for the prisoners. And not just that, but sight for the blind. Jesus in his ministry would heal the blind, restore their sight. But he still today also restores those who are spiritually blind those who cannot see what God has done, those who are blinded because of all of the corruption of the world around us or the allure of those things that destroy. Jesus brings sight. And he does that through his good news, his word of truth. He enables people who are spiritually blind to suddenly see. Has that happened in your life? I know it's happened in mine. I know how God has opened my eyes, not because of anything that I did, but because of his mercy to show me just how desperately I need a savior and how good he is. He really does restore sight to those who are blind. 
Jesus goes on and he says, he brings deliverance. This is the what he quotes from the prophet Isaiah. He says, he has come to set the oppressed free. That word translated oppressed has the at its root the, the sense of brokenness, something that has been shattered. Today, there are many people who feel their lives are broken. Their hopes have been shattered. And Jesus brings good news. It is the good news that he delivers us. He delivers us from oppression. He frees us from bondage. He can do what seems humanly impossible because with God, nothing is impossible. And those are the words that he spoke in his hometown, in the synagogue at Nazareth. But he didn't stop there. He went on to say he has come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, what that is referring to is what is known as the year of Jubilee. In the Torah, God told Moses to tell the Israelites that every 50th year was to be a year of Jubilee. Bonds were to be broken. Debts were forgiven. They were to start all over again. And what Jesus is saying is debts are paid. Because of what he has done on the cross, because of his blood that was shed for us, because of his sacrifice at Calvary, he paid all the cost and the price for my sin and for yours. Our debts have been paid, and by faith in him, we receive that incredible gift. And that, too, is what Jesus is speaking of and pointing toward as he quotes these words in the synagogue at Nazareth. And at that point, we're told, all spoke well of him. They thought, wow, this hometown boy really does speak well. Isn't this incredible? But then, but then Luke tells us uh, something else bubbled to the surface. Keep in mind, these were religious people. But as is so often the case, familiarity breeds contempt. They knew Jesus. They knew he was just a hometown boy from this little town. And so, underneath, below the surface, other things were bubbling up. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked, verse 22? In other words, he's one of us. Who does he think he is? Who does he think he is? You know, it's not uncommon for people today to react that way to Jesus as well. Who does he think he is? How dare he impose on my life? How dare he tell me that this is wrong? How dare he speak of sin? How dare he speak of redemption and forgiveness? What do I have to repent of? And that's exactly what happened among the crowd. Now keep in mind, these were not irreligious people. And I think it's very important for us to keep that at the very forefront of our own thoughts as we look at these words. These are not people who were ungodly, who denied the existence of God, who were simply living for themselves. These were people who professed to believe in the God of Israel, the God of the Bible. But when they see Jesus, they're offended. And so Jesus speaks to them. This is what he said. Verse 23, Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. (laughs) Jesus can see what's going on below the surface. He is a real man, but he is God. And dear friends, God knows. God always knows. You and I may be able to fool others. We may be able to hide from people around us. We may be able to cover things up. But the fact is, God sees it all. And God sees behind the masks of our lives. God sees the hidden moments. God knows what's in the soul and in the heart. And Jesus, looking at the crowd, knows what's going on. And he says to them, You'll probably quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. (laughs) That may well be alluding to the fact that these are people who are thinking, this guy's crazy. Who does he think he is? 
Jesus goes on to say, you'll say, do here in your hometown what we heard you did in Capernaum. Now, these are people who had seen Jesus as he grew up. These are people who knew this was a sinless man. (laughs) And yet, basically what they're saying is, yeah, well, what have you done for me lately? We need some more proof. Prove to us, you know, do some signs, do some miracles for us. And then, you know, then we'll accept you. Isn't that exactly the way Herod Antipas reacted to Jesus when he was brought before him at the time of his trial under Pilate? Do a miracle for me. Jesus says, I see. I see into your hearts. And so he continues on. Luke tells us, verse 24, Truly I tell you, Jesus continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Well, Jesus continues his exposition of the scripture. And he goes from words of grace to words of conviction. And he speaks to the people in his hometown and reminds them of one of the darkest periods in Israel's history. It was the time of Elijah and Elisha. It is recorded in the books of First and Second Kings, the latter part of First Kings and the first part of Second Kings. It was one of the, the, the most painful times in all of Israel's history. A, a people who had been delivered out of bondage in Egypt, a people who had seen the incredible grace and protection of God, a people who had witnessed and experienced God's blessings at the time of David and Solomon, but a people who had rebelled against God, who worshipped false deities, who prided themselves on their religious purity, but who in reality were living for themselves and had rejected everything that God had said. It was a time of national apostasy, and spiritual poverty. It was a dark day. And dear friends, it's a day that is not dissimilar from the day and age in which you and I find ourselves. We live in a nation that has traditionally thought of itself as a Christian nation. And yet, in spite of that Christian veneer, what has happened in our culture is far from Christian. We, we, have, we have basically done what ancient Israel has done. And that is, we have followed gods of our own making. We've made our own rules. We have determined what we want to do and what we want to believe and what we want to accept. We have redefined what God has said and established our own morality. And it is destroying us from within. Jesus recognized those same symptoms in the people of his day. Oh, they were religious. <laughs> but, and so he points out, during Israel's darkest time, what happened? Elijah was sent to a Gentile widow in Zarephath and gave her food miraculously because The oil did not run out, and the flour did not disappear. It's recorded in in 1 Kings. And then Jesus uses another illustration. He says, there were many lepers in Israel, but only one leper was healed by Elisha, and that was Naaman, and he was a Syrian, a Gentile, because by and large, the people of God had wandered off their own way. 
You know, it is very easy for us today to look at these words from Luke chapter 4 and say, oh yeah, those fo- folks back in Israel in the first century, you know, they, they took for granted the things of God and they, they rejected what God had to offer in the Lord Jesus. But before, before we throw stones at those who've gone before us, it's important to look in the mirror. And Jesus' words speak to our generation, to our culture. And dare I say it, to religious people. Keep in mind what I told you at the outset of this message. The best evidence that we have today indicates that Galilee, especially the area around Nazareth, was the equivalent of the Bible Belt of ancient Israel. These were religious people. And yet they were proud, self-centered, and arrogant. Jesus is reminding them that God is merciful But God cannot be conned. God is not impressed with human religion. What he desires is those who are humble in spirit and contrite of heart and who tremble at his word, even as he spoke through Isaiah the prophet. And so when Jesus speaks these words in the synagogue at Nazareth, they are not well received. Jesus preaches an astonishing sermon, but it's a sermon that almost gets him killed. That, by the way, is not unprecedented in the Bible. One of the best sermons in all the New Testament was one preached by Stephen in the book of Acts, and at the end of it, they stoned him. Here's what happened in Nazareth after Jesus spoke these words. We read verse 28. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. He didn't shake hands at the end of the service, I'm gathering. (laughs) And it appears they didn't even finish with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Amen. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Instead, they went right to the brow of the hill and they were ready to kill him. How dare you speak these words to us? How dare you speak words that convict our souls? How dare you say something that is not comfortable? But I would remind you, our God is not comfortable. He comforts, but he's not comfortable. He is God. He is holy. In first century Israel, Jesus spoke words that divided. He spoke words of truth. To those who are humble, to those who are repentant, his words brought joy and life. And today, to those who are humble in spirit, contrite in their souls, who tremble at his word. (laughs) He brings boundless joy, and he gives hope and purpose and meaning. He gives life forevermore. He is good. (laughs) But he, he will not be taken for a ride. As I said earlier, you cannot con him. He knows. He knows the very deepest secrets of our lives. And to those who humble themselves and repent before him, he gives life and forgiveness. But to those who are proud of their own accomplishments, anger is what follows. And so they took him to the brow of the hill, and they were ready to kill him. (laughs) Here's what Luke tells us happened next. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. How does he do that? (laughs) The answer is because he is the very son of God. Because he is the Messiah. Because he is the God man. Because he is our savior and our redeemer. That is one of the reasons I believe that Luke's account differs from the accounts of Matthew and Mark. 
I realize that many students have argued back and forth over the years, was this one visit or two? I believe the prevailing evidence would suggest two visits. And what that means is, Jesus came back. You see, he does not give up on people who've turned their backs on him. He continues to reach out to them. And even today, to those who are proud of their accomplishments and boast of their religion, he desires to bring restoration and healing. To those who are brokenhearted and discouraged, he desires to bring healing. And to those who are caught up in bondage to sin and death, to drugs and alcohol, to addictions, he desires to bring relief, freedom, broken chains, restoration, and renewal. Because he is the living God come to earth in human flesh, and he can do anything. And that's true for you and me as well. He can do and accomplish anything in our lives. And he offers that to those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at his word. May we be that kind of people. And may God grant that kind of revival and renewal and awakening in our nation that hearts may be turned back to him, that proud souls may come before God in humility, and that broken hearts may be healed. Because that's his work, and that's what he does, and he is good. He simply walked right through the crowd, but he comes to those who hear his voice. May you and I be listening always. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus, we thank you for not just what you have done, but above all for who you are. We thank you for your graciousness. We thank you that you speak the truth. Lord, we praise you that you do not candy coat things, but you do offer balm and healing. You offer honey for the soul and restoration for our wounds, balm for our brokenness. We bless your holy name. Forgive us those times when we have been proud, arrogant, and boastful about our spiritual accomplishments. May we always come before you with a humble heart, with a contrite spirit. And may we daily experience the power of your Holy Spirit, who changes us from within by the good news, the gospel that you have brought, delivered, and fulfilled. Amen. I, I'd invite you, by the way, to take some time with the people you're gathered with, whether you're in a home or perhaps uh, in a uh, an office somewhere, perhaps uh, in a coffee shop or uh, just out in the backyard, wherever you are, if you take some time just to uh, talk about some of the things that we've discussed together this morning. I put up here on the screen a few questions that uh, may be helpful in, in guiding that discussion. Uh, first of all, how have the words of Luke 4, 18 and 19 been fulfilled in your life through the Lord Jesus? You know, Jesus says the spirit of the Lord was on him, that he has been anointed. That's the same root word as Messiah to proclaim good news to the poor to bring freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. How have those words become a living reality in your life? And if they haven't, I would say now's a great time to say, Lord, I want what you have to offer. Uh, secondly, it's been said that familiarity breeds contempt. How can familiarity with Christianity cause the gospel of Jesus to become less influential in your life? What have you found helpful to counteract this tendency? You know, it is very easy to take the good things of God for granted. 
And particularly for those of us who've quote unquote grown up in the church, it's very easy to get lackadaisical and to simply look at ourselves and say, hey, boy, compared to the rest of the world, I'm doing so much better. (laughs) What a lie. We desperately need what only God can offer. And we are beggars all. And what he gives is what transforms and changes us. How have you found strength in your life to live for the Lord? And what are some ways that you have found helpful in counteracting that tendency to just take him for granted? Thanks so much for listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Today's program was sponsored by Awake Us Now. We hope today's message was a blessing. If you are asking yourself, now what? We encourage you to learn more about God at our website, awakeusnow.com. And please come back and join us again next time.